we're going to go into some battery basics. If you have a pen and if you have a paper, if you're stationary, um, you may want to take notes. This section's a little dense. Uh, it's probably going to be the most dense section of the entire course. So I apologize ahead of time for people who don't like density. <laughs> So essentially, these are just the basic components of, of if you're going to build your own battery or even if you purchase a battery off the shelf, that's going to you're going to use to power devices uh, remotely. Or disconnected from the grid off grid, so you'll need a source. So you'll need a way to recharge the battery. Solar is a popular source. Uh, plugging into a wall is a popular source. A car, you can use a car to recharge a battery. That is a source that will recharge a battery. You can use a bicycle. There's a, a lot of different ways. Bicycle, hydro, you, if you have a creek or something like that on your property or a steady flow of water that's moving from a high location to a low location, you can put a, a DC turbine, a little DC motor on that. And as it spins, it will generate electricity and that can charge a battery as well. Wind, it works in a very similar way as water where you just take a DC motor, hook it up to some blades. And as that turns, that will generate electricity that can charge a battery as well. Um, so just different ways there that you can do it. When I was a little younger, our bicycles, we didn't have these little LED lights. We had these little uh, DC motors that would attach to your wheel. And whenever you wanted a light, you'd click a button and that would run against the wheel and that would generate your light working. So the faster that you rode your bike, the brighter the light would be. And then when you slow down, it goes dim. So that was straight from a DC motor to a light, to a DC light that would light up. We could replace that light with the battery. It would recharge a rechargeable battery also. So just things to think about. Number one was the source. Number two, what's called a charge controller. Charge controller, what that does is it takes whatever the energy is that's coming in. And I'll use the example that I just gave about riding my bicycle. So if I rode my bicycle faster, the light would get brighter. And if I slow down, the light would get more dim. The reason that happens is because the amount of current that's coming through. So faster, higher current, brighter light, great slower, not so much energy is coming through. So it's, it's lower. What a charge controller does is it regulates that and it takes that energy and then sends it to your battery at a steady rate. So your battery doesn't um, go berserk essentially. So a charge controller. The next thing you need is a battery place to store. So now you have this energy coming in, it's going through a charge controller, it's being cleaned. And now you need a place to store that energy, and that would be the battery. And we're going to get into batteries right after this. There's different types of batteries that we'll go over. And the fourth thing you need is what's called a load, how you're going to discharge it. So you've saved this energy, you've stored it. What are you going to use it for? And that's where I put community next to that. So that could be discharged in a uh, physical way, such as taking the battery somewhere, plugging something into it, powering a light bulb, powering a refrigerator, um, powering a microphone. It could also be discharged in other ways, like uh, spiritual ways, uh, which is just like what we're doing now. Like we're not actually discharging anything, but we're just talking about uh, the energy that's stored in a way where it's being utilized, there is a load, it is building community, it is bringing people together. And we are trying to come together and have a, a general understanding. So just different ways to think about how that um, load or where that energy is going. Any questions about those four before we move on? I'm gonna ask if there's questions because again, this is a, a dense section here. I have a question. Is this as in depth are you going to go in regards to like how the battery works or are you going to go in more detail later or is this like as much as you think we need to know? Thank you. That is a good question. 
this is as basic as this is, as basic really as it is. We can complicate it with a lot of other things, which I'm trying not to do, but we are going to also have a resource section for people who like to get deeper into it and learn more about it. Uh, we, we will have a section on that. So right now we're just going to talk about, this is an overview. This is the basic components you need. If you can gather these components, you can probably build a, a decent battery to do a lot of different things. This is the same exact components. If you have a home solar system, you have uh, 10,000 kilowatts on your roof. These are the same things it needs. Sun, somewhere, a source, it's gonna need a charge controller, which they call inverters, which they put inside of your garage. And then it needs a battery. If you're gonna be off grid, it needs a place to store the energy and then it needs a load your, all your equipment inside of your house. Uh, if you have an RV, same thing, anything that's off grid follows the same parameters here. So it's basic, but it is basic. <laughs> so we're gonna keep it there. In fact, it's so basic that this is also the component of an um, entire microgrid. It's also an entire, uh, the component of our entire electricity grid. It's just yeah. creating that loop of electricity. Yeah. And again, whether you're talking hydro or talking wind or talking solar, these are the components here. More dirty energy. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to fly through these kind of quickly. There's three main type of batteries that people are familiar with and use. There's a, what's called a lead acid battery. If you have a car, uh, a non-electric car, a uh, gas vehicle or a propane vehicle or a hydro electric vehicle, they all have um, lead acid batteries underneath the hoods for the majority of them, unless you upgrade to an AMG battery, um, which is also a lead acid battery. It's just a different type of lead acid battery. And we'll get into that on the next slide. This slide is, is put here more for reference. So something for us to come back to or the, the group to come back to if they want to have a breakdown. Lead acid batteries do have the most maintenance. 200 bucks to get you a lead acid battery. And this will show the charge time here. It also shows cycles, which means how many times you can discharge that battery and recharge it. 300. An AM battery, you can discharge and recharge 500 times. The price is about twice that of a lead acid battery. The reason for the price difference is because of the maintenance goes down with the AMG battery. You don't have to worry about AMG batteries leaking. However, they do off gas. So that's something to be concerned about if you're going to store it in a confined space. They need to be vented, so you need to have airflow. And then lithium, um, and we're going to go more into lithium. Lithium is kind of like the new thing, newer thing of the three that a lot of people are excited about, uh, lithium batteries. Um, and you can see why. 3,000 plus cycles, it, the run times are the longest. How long they last as far as their lifespan is 10 plus years. They're virtually maintenance free. And there's a question in chat, are all of these car batteries? No, lead acid uh, usually are using cars, AMG are using cars. Lithium batteries would be your, what do you call these newer cars? Electric vehicles. So like your Teslas or your, I think all the manufacturers have electric vehicles now. Ford, Chevy, VW, they all have an electric vehicle. So your EV is gonna be the lithium there. Lead acid batteries, a couple of things I'm just pointing out here that I think I might have already said these are the cheapest up front. So they have the lowest cost, but they do have the highest maintenance. Compared to lithium batteries, you're going to be spending over the lifespan four to six times the amount um, over a 10 year span. Um, G batteries, somebody put this in chat already, but they stand for absorbent glass matte batteries. Uh, they use fiberglass inside of them to, to store the lead acid. Um, that fiberglass absorbs that and has a slower discharge rate, which, which is why people like the a AGMs because they don't spill. If you have them on their side, you don't have to worry about the, the acid coming out or the water coming out of the battery. 
and you don't have to worry about refilling them either. Next slide, lithium batteries, again, lithium batteries. I don't actually want to repeat anything I've said already. They're most cost efficient if you're looking at over a 10 year span, how much you're going to be um, spending on them. So if you're making a decision about what you're going to use for battery storage right now, lithium battery is an option, a long-term option. So we're going to go just briefly over what a watt hour is. Essentially, there's a formula here that if you want to write down, I'd suggest you write it down. It's A times B equals W, which is amps times voltage equals wattage. There's a second formula that you may want to write down, which is W divided by V equals A. So watts divided by voltage equals your amperage. I give both of these formulas because when you buy devices, sometimes they'll tell you the wattage and it's very easy. Just look at the sticker and say, hey, that's, that's my wattage. This is what I'm going to be using per hour. Sometimes it doesn't. It just gives you the amperage. It'll give you the voltage that it runs at and the amperage. And using this formula, you can figure out what the wattage is yourself. If you have an 100, and this just goes what we talked about before, if you have a 100 watt light bulb and you're going to use it for one hour, uh, it will consume 100 watts. So very basic. Uh, two hours, I'm sure everyone can do that math in their head. And then for amp hours, if you have a 100 watt light bulb to be used for, thank you for the answer. <laughs> if you have a 100 watt light bulb and you use it for one hour, it will consume 8.6 amps. So if you use that for two hours, very simple. You just double that is what you would have for your answer there. Again, the reason why I'm pointing out this, when you purchase batteries, sometimes they're listed as watt hours and sometimes they're uh, listed as amp. Oh, this is a 200 amp hour battery. So now you know what that means and why you would need that information. Sometimes it's listed as wattage. This is a 2000 watt battery and you'll have to go, okay, what the hell does that mean? This way you can distinguish the two and you, your question is like at the very bottom, what you need to know is how many watts your devices use. So if you have that information, or if you have the amperage that your devices use, you can figure out how you're gonna size your battery based off of that. A vacuum would have like 12 volts, 12 um, amps. Mm -hmm. And, that, and I, we'd wanna know like how much of a battery would be each run down. So that's the, that second formula I gave you there. So if it just gives you your amps, like it's a 12 amp battery, it runs at 120 volts, mm -hmm. then you would just use that second formula there to figure out what the wattage is. Sorry, the first formula, I apologize. The amps times volts gives you your wattage. So if you have a 12 amp battery at 120 volts, what is that, 1440? I think it's 1440 uh, watts. So that would tell you if I'm using a, a per hour. So if I'm using a vacuum for an hour, it's going to discharge uh, 1440. Watts. I've got a question. Is yep. 100 watts always 12 volts? No, that's a very good question. Inside of our home, there's a lot of different types of voltages we use. Outlets in our home normally use either 120 volts or 220 volts, and they look different. So like your gas dryer will use 220, also called 240. And a standard outlet would use 110, also called 120 volts. So your normal outlets that you would plug a vacuum into is 120 volts, which is why I can say 12 amps times 120 volts. If you set a, a dryer, a, an electric dryer, that's 240 volts. So it would be whatever the amperage of the dryer is times 240 volts, and you would get your wattage for that appliance. Pretty much everything in your home is standard except for your EV charger, your dryer. If you have a air conditioner, like one of those big air conditioners, those also use 240 volts. But the plug is that big dryer plug, and that's an easy way that you can distinguish it. I was just going to explain if people are interested, just the difference between the watts and the volts, if you're interested. So watts is a rate of energy per second so like how many how much work it's doing per second how like much it's able to do um sometimes watt hours is useful right so how much work it's able to do in an hour and then a voltage is actually like how fast 
the electrons are moving or like the difference in how the battery itself or the converter is structured. So I think that what might be useful is just understanding that a watt is a, is a measure of how much work is happening per second. And sometimes it's useful for an appliance that might say a watt hour or how many watt hours it will say like, how many hours can it work at this rate before dying, right? Or how much can how much work can it do for how many hours? Because seconds isn't as useful as hours before it dies. So I think it's been helpful for me to think about watts in terms of like power and work. And then voltage might be more so so you don't blow a fuse or it's less hard, it's harder to explain, but if anyone wants to talk about that more afterwards. And there's a lot of a lot of YouTube's out there, a lot of information online, which is why we won't get into that. But your outlets at home, 120 is like jump roping with one rope and 240 is like double dutching. So you'll have actually two 120 strands and now you're double dutching with those.